Welcome to CS350. This is Karthik Gopalan. In this lecture, we will learn about threads which enable concurrency within a single process. So, the problem we are so trying to solve is how do we execute multiple tasks concurrently? Let's say that you want to do one task. The traditional way of doing this would be to start one process to do one task. Let's say that now you had two tasks to execute. Then you may create two processes. You may fork one process from the other process. If you had n tasks, then you may create n processes, one for each task. The problem with this approach is that since there are multiple processes, you may have to use the fork system call to create multiple processes. So the first obvious problem is that fork is pretty expensive. You have to create an entire virtual address space for every process along with all the page tables, file directories, all the kernel data structures that represent a process and so on. Secondly, switching from one process to another process on the CPU is pretty expensive because of context switching overhead. As we all know, context switching overhead is dominated by the cold start penalty, which means that the caches such as TLB, hardware caches and so on need to be warmed up when you switch from one process to another. So what if these multiple processes that are executing different tasks, they want to talk to each other? So if they want to talk to each other, let's say to exchange data or to synchronize with each other, then they need to use inter-process communication mechanism. Some of the inter-process communication mechanisms that we learned were shared memory, pipes, sockets, signals, and so on. So the problem with using inter-process communication mechanisms between processes is that these IPC mechanisms are implemented through system calls, which means that a process which wants to communicate with another process needs to tell the operating system then the operating system would switch from the first process to the second process. So there are kernel transitions involved, CPU scheduling involved, and again context switching is involved, which is very expensive. If you want to avoid the overhead of kernel to user transitions, then you could use inter-process shared memory but again, inter-process shared memory involves some setup operation between processes. So, and some programmers may find that inconvenient. So, if we want to avoid all these problems involved with setting up multiple processes and setting up inter-process communication, then there are other options. The first option is to use only a single process. This option we called event-driven programming. So in this model, we use a single process to execute multiple tasks. So let's say each task is executed in response to some event. Let's say events one through n. Event one triggers task one, event two, trigger, two triggers task two, and so on. So the process would have a large busy while loop and this while loop would go through every event and check if the event is, has been triggered. If an event is triggered, then it would execute the corresponding task. So if you follow this model, then you have only one process that's dividing up its time among multiple tasks. So no inter-process communication is required since there are not multiple processes. You have only a single process. Since you're going from one task to another in a sequence, so the number of tasks in the sequence determines the length of the response time. So the more the number of tasks, the longer the response time for each event. This model works well if you have stateless tasks, that is that, which means that if you execute a task, you don't have to remember any information about the task in its next execution. Suppose you do need to remember some state 
across multiple executions of a task, then this model becomes a little more complicated because now you need to introduce global state that and then you need to maintain consistency across that global state between multiple iterations of the while loop. If you have inter-task dependencies, let's say task 2 depends on task 1, then you may need to maintain inter-task dependencies in some form. Again, the structure of the program becomes more and more complicated as there are inter-task synchronization and data exchange requirements. So, so, so the event-driven programming model works well for simple stateless tasks, but for complicated stateful tasks, again, we need something better. So the second option is to use threads. Threads provide you concurrency within a single process, while at the same time, they enable efficient data sharing between different uh, concurrent tasks. So in this model, we have a single process with a single address space, but then we have multiple threads of control. What we mean by that is that each thread has its own program counter, its own stack and stack pointer, its own registers, and so on. So essentially, every thread has its own execution state, but all the threads share the same memory address space of the process. So all threads share the code, the heap, static data, and any dynamically linked libraries. So this way, if one thread writes some data to the shared address space, then it is immediately visible to the other threads in the process. This works very similarly to how shared memory works, except that now we don't have multiple address spaces, we have a single address space that is shared by all the threads. So this way, when you switch from one thread to another thread on the CPU, then there is lower context switching overhead because you don't need to switch the memory, memory context, virtual memory context, for example, things like page tables. So you don't need to flush the TLB if the architecture so requires. Since the address space is shared, there is no inter-process communication. All the data is instantly shared between all the threads. You may still need inter-thread synchronization, which means that you need some signaling mechanism to in indicate events from one thread to another thread. But as far as data transfer is concerned, there is zero cost of data transfer. There are some other shared and non-shared components between threads. If a, a thread opens files or sockets or, or any devices, then the same open descriptors are available to other threads to use. If a thread installs a signal handler, then the same signal handler is applicable for all the threads. So this interaction between signals and threads can be a bit of a problem um, if you are not careful about how you use uh, signals in, in, in combination with threads. There are some components that are not shared. For example, every thread has its own thread ID. The global variable ERNO, which indicates the return value of a system, error value returned by a system call, this is again per thread because you don't want different threads which are making different system calls to share a common error value. So although error, error node appears to be a global variable, but in fact it is thread local. Plus, in addition, there might be thread-specific priority that is maintained by the CPU scheduler. So here's an example of a scenario where you might use threads. Let's say you have a word processor that has multiple threads. One of the threads may be responsible for handling input from the keyboard. Another thread may be responsible for rendering the output on the display. And a third thread may be responsible for writing data to the disk. So these three threads are operating concurrently, which means that 
if one of these threads blocks then the other threads can still continue to execute so for example if the keyboard uh, thread blocks waiting for keyboard input then the thread that is writing data to the disk and still continue saving the file another example is a multi-threaded web server multi-threaded web server is a web server is a program that runs on remote servers and, and services web pages for remote clients so these servers usually receive a network connection from the from the internet and then they would fetch the corresponding file that is requested by the client and return the contents of the file back to the client so this web server can be modeled as a multi-threaded process as follows you could have a single dispatcher thread which is responsible for receiving or accepting a network connection and then distributing the requests among one of multiple threads so these background threads are known as worker threads so the dispatcher's job would be to determine which worker thread is least loaded and to assign an incoming connection to the worker thread the worker thread would then fetch the page from the disk and return the page back to the remote client so again the benefit here is that you get concurrency you can if if one of the threads is busy the other threads can still make progress if one of the threads is blocked then the other threads can still make progress however as you might notice that you know, there are certain disadvantages for these threads first that there is global shared state in the thread so the same thing that was an advantage in terms of inter inter thread communication it's now also a disadvantage because if any one thread makes accidental changes to the shared data then all the threads will be affected which means that we need to carefully manage the concurrence concurrent access to shared data so this becomes a programmer's responsibility second problem is that threads and signals don't mix well if you install a common signal handler for all the threads then when a signal arrives it's not clear which specific thread was the intended target of the signal so it can become very complicated to program this correctly third big problem is the lack of robustness if any one of the threads crashes then the entire process will crash because the entire memory state is shared so there is no isolation between threads so as a result you have to be really careful when you're using thread if you need any sort of robustness you need to consider other programming models finally some library functions may not be thread safe some library functions maintain internal state that may be kept that may be maintained across multiple calls to the library function so over time most of the commonly used library functions have been made thread safe meaning that their internal state has either been removed or it has been maintained in a manner that is thread specific however if you do write a library in the future as a programmer then you need to be careful that the library is thread safe because some programmers who use threads may end up using your library So going back to the robustness example, if let's say that in the web server program, one of the threads crashed, then your entire web server would have crashed. One way to increase the robustness of the web server would be to use multiple processes. So if you had multiple processes and one of the processes crashed, then the other processes can still continue to serve network connections. Now, as a result of that, your overall web server is more safe. Now, you can get the advantages of both threads and processes by having multiple processes in the web server, and within each process, you can have multiple threads. Many commercial web servers, such as the Apache web server, which is very widely used, 
they tend to use this hybrid model where you have multiple processes and within each process there are multiple threads. So there are two types of threads, user level threads and kernel level threads as far as the implementation of threads is concerned. In the case of user level threads, the operating system does not understand the notion of threads. In this case, the threads are implemented as part of user level libraries. So every process would link itself to some library which provides the threads functionality. So during runtime, the threads library would create the illusion of having multiple threads within a single process. So every thread will have its own stack and its own execution flow. And whenever one thread gives up the CPU, the library would switch the execution to another thread. So in this model, each thread can make progress independently as long as it's not performing a blocking system call. If any thread performs a blocking system call, then the entire process would block. That is, all the threads within the process would block because the operating system does not understand that there are multiple threads within this process. On the other hand, you, you have kernel level threads where the operating system explicitly recognizes the fact that there are multiple threads within a process. And the operating system is able to schedule these processes independent, uh, schedule these threads independent of each other. So in this example, now if one of the threads blocks in with the kernel level threads implementation, then the kernel has the ability to pick another thread from within the same process. Blocking of one thread does not automatically block the entire process. So in the first case, with user level threads, this type of concurrency is known as apparent concurrency because you get the illusion that you have multiple concurrent threads, but when a blocking operation happens, then the entire process blocks. With the case of kernel level threads, you get true concurrency, meaning that when a blocking operation happens, in fact, other threads are able to make progress. However, there are some advantages of user level threads as well. Since the threads are implemented in user space, switching from one thread to another thread is completely a user level operation. The decision to switch from one thread to another thread within a process is made entirely by the library functions. Whereas in the case of kernel level threads, switching from one thread to another requires the involvement of the operating system, which means that you need to perform a user to kernel transition in order to do a context switch. So there's a higher context switch overhead between threads with kernel level threads. So, and for highly computation intensive tasks, one might prefer to have user level threads. There are some hybrid implementations where you might split up your job between computation intensive and IO intensive jobs and you might dedicate separate kernel threads for each type of job. Within each kernel thread you might have multiple user level threads that might give you apparent concurrency in user space. So this way you can combine the benefits of both user and kernel level threads. Another dimension to consider is how the CPU time slice is divided up between threads of different processes. The first model here is called local thread scheduling. Let's say that process one gets the control of the CPU and let's say one of the threads gives up control of the CPU without using up the entire process time slice. The question is, should you pick up a thread from the same process or from another process? In local thread scheduling, you would pick up another thread from the same process because the current process still has time slice remaining on the CPU. So when you do something like local thread scheduling, then you are trying to be more fair to the current process. 
you're trying to give credit for the current time to the current process. This type of scheduling can be implemented either with kernel level threads or user level threads. It means that either the operating system or the user level libraries can implement local thread scheduling. As an example in the picture, your possible schedules are A1, A2, A3, A1, A2, A3, and so on, as long as process A has the current time slice. However, you may not be able to mix threads from different processes, such as A1, B1, A2, B3, A3, B3, and so on, within the same process time slice, because these threads belong to different processes. The other model is global thread scheduling. Here, when it's time to pick the next thread, the CPU scheduler picks the most eligible thread from any process in the system, not just the current process. Here, the goal is to make the most efficient use of the CPU. So, for example, if you have two processes A and B, and process A gives up the CPU, you might pick a thread from process B because the process B's thread is the most eligible thread with the highest priority in the system. So the global thread scheduling can only be implemented as kernel level threads because only the operating system has a global view of all the threads across all the processes. In the next slide we look at some of the programming interfaces for using threads these threads usually start these interfaces usually start with the prefix p thread which indicates posix threads posix is the standards body which standardizes the interfaces for threads so just like you have a fork operation to create processes Similarly, you have a pthread create operation to create threads. Just like you have an exit system call to exit from a process, similarly, you have a pthread exit call to exit from a thread. Just like regular processes would terminate once you return from the main function, similarly, if you return from the initial routine or the initial function of the thread, then the thread would terminate. Just like with processes, you have wait system call to wait for a child process. Similarly, for threads, you have pthread join where a parent thread can wait for a child thread to terminate. Here's an example where we use pthread create to start a thread and the thread starts executing the thread func function. In fact, we execute the pthread create in a for loop to create n threads within the same process. And all of them execute the thread func function. Within the thread func function, we are incrementing a counter. You would notice that we have intentionally created a race condition here because the increment of the counter is not protected. So, which means that different threads can try to increment the counter concurrently. If the increment operation is not atomic operation, then we will end up with a situation where different threads may interleave the increment operation during their execution. And you might end up with a final counter value, which is less than n. So I encourage you to try to figure out how this is possible how you can end up with a final counter value that's less than n. There are additional programming details about how you can synchronize between threads such as using mutex or condition variables. These details will not be covered in the lecture but you can always look up the details either through tutorials or man pages.